Good morning and welcome to Indian Trail Presbyterian Church. Uh, my name is Stephen Ratliff. I'm the pastor here and this is the fifth Sunday of the Lenten journey from Ash Wednesday uh, through the, the cross and grave to the great celebration of Easter which comes in a couple of weeks. And this is our third Sunday recording our worship services because we have been uh, forced to, to separate ourselves due to the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, so we are welcoming you whether, whenever and wherever you are joining us this morning. Uh, greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and welcome. I want to offer a few announcements about the church life in the next few weeks. Um, we, this is all strange to us and we're, we're learning as we go. But we are entering, getting ready to enter the holiest week of the church year, beginning next Sunday with Palm Sunday. So I wanted to tell you what we're thinking about some of the worship services going forward into Holy Week and through Holy Week. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday, and uh, as we have done the last few years, and I, as I have done many years in my ministry, uh, next Sunday we're going to, to uh, read and, and reflect upon the a triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem when people waved the palm branches and laid them on the ground and laid their cloaks on the ground as, as Jesus came into Jerusalem. But we're also going to read next Sunday the uh, extended passion narrative from Matthew's Gospel. Uh, and that is the story that goes from Jesus' last supper that he has with his disciples the night that he will be arrested. Uh, through that arrest and trial, uh, through his crucifixion and to the point of his death. The reason that I think it's important to hear that whole story all together at once is that very seldom do we actually hear that whole narrative. We hear bits and pieces of it here and there, but I think it's a powerful thing to hear that, that whole narrative. And also because uh, for many people who are not able to worship during Holy Week at some of the special services like Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, um, if you only worship on Palm Sunday and then on Easter Sunday, uh, you get the great celebration of palm branches waving and cloaks being laid on the ground on Palm Sunday. And then you go straight to the great celebration of resurrection, the empty tomb, Jesus rising from the, from the grave. And we don't have to necessarily deal with the, the darkness of Holy Week, which is an important theological piece of our faith. Uh, the depths of pain and suffering that Jesus endured on our behalf. So, Palm Sunday, we will have an extended reading of the Passion narrative from, from Matthew's Gospel. We are going to try to have some of our services during Holy Week. Uh, the pastor at the Methodist Church and I are working on ways that we will try to live stream Maundy Thursday ser service. That's not this coming Thursday, but a week from Thursday, uh, where we will have some readings, liturgy, and perhaps communion together virtually. Um, and then on Good Friday, I will post a worship video with the solemn approaches of the cross, and I'll post that by noon on Good Friday. Then on Easter Sunday, um, we are trying very hard. I've talked with a couple of elders so far, and I'm going to talk with more about the possibility of having some sort of drive-up service on su Easter Sunday morning. We can't come together in the sanctuary as God's people uh, because of the the, the social distancing that we're being asked to do, but we're going to see if there's a way that perhaps we can invite you, if you're able to come, drive up to the church, stay in our cars so that we're separated from one another, but have some sort of celebration of resurrection on that Easter Sunday morning. So look for details about these things in your email or on our Facebook page uh, in, the, in the days to come. We are here to worship God, and I want to begin our worship this morning. The last couple of weeks we have begun with a psalm, and I want to begin this morning with a very familiar psalm to most people. Um, it's probably the psalm that if you ask people what's your favorite psalm, most people will say Psalm 23, or if they don't know the number, they'll say the Lord is my shepherd. Now, you know, sometimes I've been told that cliches are often uh, cliches because there's truth in them. And the reality is that this psalm is so very well known and so very popular because it is so powerful, because it is so valuable to us as people of faith. And it is valuable because what it says to us is, 
whatever life brings, whatever dark valley we walk through, whatever brokenness we are experiencing, God is with us. God doesn't say in this psalm that we won't have to go through the valley of the shadow of death, but as we go through it, and all the way through it, God promises to be with us in that valley and through that valley. I want to read this psalm, first of all, from a, uh, a version that may not be as familiar to you. Uh, it's from Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of the Bible, which he entitled The Message. And so I want to read, because this psalm is so familiar, I want to read it in this probably unfamiliar version uh, so that we might hear it in a new way, and then I will follow it with a more uh, well-known version from the New Revised Standard Version. Let us listen for a word from God from Psalm 23. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. You have bedded me down in lush meadows, you find me quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath and send me in the right direction. Even when the way goes through the death valley, I am not afraid when you walk at my side. Your trusty shepherd's crook makes me feel secure. You serve me a six-course dinner right in front of my enemies. You revive my drooping head. My cup brims with blessing. Your beauty and love chase after me every day of my life. I'm back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. One of my favorite parts of that uh, paraphrase of this psalm is the first part of that last verse. Not surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, but your beauty and love chase after me every day of my life. Well, let's hear the psalm now from a more familiar version. This, well, in all honesty, this is the New Revised Standard Version, but because of the way I learned this psalm, I can't help but add in a little King James version here and there in some of these phrases. And so I guess this is the author, I mean the uh, preacher's translation. Let us listen for a word from God again from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. May God bless the, the promise and the truth of this psalm uh, to all of our life and all of our lives. Amen. I want to turn now to the scripture readings for the day and uh, to our, our sermon. And we are today concluding an 11-week series on the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. We have been looking at the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, not so much at AA itself, but at the spirituality of the 12 steps to see what the spirituality in these 12 steps has to, uh, 
teach us or, or just remind us about our own Christian spirituality. And so as we um, prepare to conclude this sermon series with the 12th step this morning, let us listen now for the word of God from, from the book of James, chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or, sis or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So, Faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. And then from Luke's gospel, from chapter 22, verses 31 to 34, these are words Jesus says to, to Peter, to Simon Peter, just before... Jesus, is, this is after the, um, at the end of the Last Supper, and just before he goes out where he will be arrested. Listen again, if you will, for a word from God. Jesus says to Peter, Simon, Simon, listen. Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your own faith may not fail. And you, once you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. And Simon Peter said to Jesus, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the cock will not crow this day until you have denied me Three times. This again is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we've come a long way in this 12-step sermon series. Um, I said just a moment ago that it was our 11th sermon in the series because we combined steps 10 and 11 last week. But we've, uh, we've come a long way. We have admitted our powerlessness. And we've decided to turn our lives over to God. We've, we've made confessions. We've made lists. We've made amends. We've come a long way. And last week, we talked about the last three steps in the 12 steps being about our relationships or the relationships among three different parties, God and us and others. And we, we talked about the cross as a reminder of those relationships, the vertical beam of the cross being our relationship to God. And, and we talked about how steps 10 and 11 uh, help us to, uh, to understand and to live out that relationship between us and God. And so today, step 12 deals with the horizontal beam of the cross, our relationships to others. Before we get to the 12th step specifically, I wanted to share with you a story. Early in my ministry, uh, very early in my ministry, um, my wife and I were having dinner with some friends. I was, we, we had not had children at the time, uh, but at this dinner, the other couple shared with us that the wife had very recently had a miscarriage. She'd been pregnant and, and miscarried early in the pregnancy. Now, I knew in an intellectual way at that moment that that was a sad thing. And I'm fairly confident that I was pastoral in that situation. Um, I'm fairly confident that I knew this must be something that was hurting them. But I didn't know. You know what I mean? I didn't, I didn't know what they were going through. Now, a few months later, 
my wife was pregnant. And early in her pregnancy, she miscarried. Now the truth is, I still didn't know and will never know what it was for her to be pregnant with a life growing inside her and then to miscarry. But I certainly knew in a different way as her husband, as her partner in life, as the one walking with her through that, um, that sadness and that loss, I certainly knew a whole lot more about it than I had a few months earlier at that dinner table. I was sharing that story with my mother who, who looked at me and said, I hope you don't have to experience every bad thing that people experience in order to be an effective pastor. And she sort of said it tongue in cheek, but with some truth as well. And it's true, of course. We can't experience every broken experience that other people have. And we don't have to experience the brokenness of other people to be good pastors or to be good sisters and brothers in Christ, to be uh, good disciples. We don't have to experience exactly what everybody else in the world experience, experiences. Uh, we may not be able to empathize. That is, we may not be able to put ourselves precisely in their shoes because we haven't lived through what they're living through. But certainly we can sympathize. We can have compassion. We can have love and care for people in their brokenness. But the truth is, it is only when we walked in someone else's shoes or shoes very much like someone else's walking that we can truly empathize and know their pain. Richard Rohr is the Catholic priest whose writings I have been using to walk me through and walk us through this 12-step sermon series. And in one of his daily devotions on the 12 steps, about four years ago, uh, four or five years ago, uh, Richard Rohr wrote this about step 12. The real authority that changes the world is an inner authority that comes from people who have lost, let go, and are refound on a new level. Now, I want to be sure we hear what he said there. The real authority that changes the world does not come from people who are really, really smart, people who've done a lot of studying, people who are wise and, and people who are, are gifted in some way. No, asserts Richard Rohr, the real authority that changes the world comes from, to paraphrase him, comes from brokenness. It comes from people who have lost, he says who have had to let go and then be refound on a new level. In other words, what Richard Gore is saying, and it's very biblical if we think about it, if we remember people like Moses and David, Peter. It's very true that God uses broken people. Broken people, continues Richard Rohr, are the people who can heal, reconcile, understand, and change others. Now, we know this to be true on some anecdotal level because we've all heard stories about how the people who can, can reach an addict, an alcoholic, best are addicts and alcoholics, people who are in recovery themselves, people who have been through the depths of that disease themselves are the people who can best reach people in that fight, in that struggle, in that pit. We've also probably heard stories or maybe experienced it, some of us, that the truth is the person who can, who can support a widow or a widower most effectively is the person who themselves has lost a spouse. Often, the people who can relate the best to someone who doesn't know where their next paycheck is coming from, someone who may not know where their next meal is coming from, often the people who can empathize 
and relate to those people the best are people who themselves have faced that need and that want. I want to continue with Richard Rohr's thoughts on this. The pattern for this new kind of authority, this authority that comes from people who are broken, who have been broken and have been refound, this authority is not new. It was taught by Jesus when he said to Simon Peter, and here Rohr paraphrases that passage we just read from Luke's gospel. Jesus says to Simon Peter, Simon, you must be sifted like wheat, and I will pray that you will not fail. And then I think, uh, this is just Stephen, I think something was lost in translation. I think there's a phrase missing here in what Jesus said. I think that phrase is, but when you do fail, <laughs> because Jesus seems to know and assume uh, that Simon Peter, in fact, later, just a few verses later, he's going to acknowledge and, and let Simon Peter know that he will fail. So Jesus says, I pray you will not fail, but once you have recovered, the text says, once you have returned, once you have recovered, Roar paraphrases, you in turn can strengthen the brothers and sisters. Once you, Simon Peter, have known brokenness, and then once you have recovered, you can help others. Rohr says that this sifting and then recovering is Peter's real and life-changing authority, as it is for anyone. Unless a bishop, a teacher, or a minister has on some level walked through suffering, through failure, or humiliation, his or her words will tend to be fine, but superficial. Okay, but harmless. Heard by the ears, but unable to touch the soul. To sum it up, as we said just a moment ago, God uses broken people to bring healing. Thus, we come to step 12 in the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Step 12 reads like this. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Having had a spiritual awakening, having been broken, and having been restored, having been recovered, we then try to carry that message to others. Doesn't that sound just like almost every evangelistic sermon you've ever heard in your life? Having known the brokenness of sin, having been a broken people, having repented and, and turned to God and having experienced the forgiveness and the compassion and the grace of God, We've got to tell somebody else. We've got to share that grace, that forgiveness, that salvation with others. Now, there are two reasons for this step. One is obvious and one is maybe not so obvious. The first reason for this step, the obvious step, is that when we have experienced grace, when we have experienced good things, we can't wait to share that with someone else. When something good happens to us, we can't wait to pick up the phone and tell somebody. We've got we've to share it. When, something, when we've experienced grace, we often want to share that grace with another person. Now, at this point in his writing, Richard Rohr uh, remembers uh, something from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous uh, about Bill Wilson. Bill Wilson is the, is the person... Uh, credited with being one of the founders of AA and is credited with being one of the primary authors of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And in the big book, Bill Wilson tells some of his story. And in this particular quote, he talks about uh, his experience at one of the lowest points just as he begins his recovery. When one of his friends, when a friend has come to him, and shared a good word of recovery and hope with him as he, Bill Wilson, is lying in the hospital as a result of his alcoholism. 
Bill Wilson writes, while I lay in the hospital, the thought came to me that there were thousands of hopeless alcoholics who might be glad to have what had been so freely given to me. Perhaps I could help some of them and they in turn might work with others. It was imperative, he continues, to work with others as my friend had worked with me. Because as my friend had said to me, quoting James that we read a few moments ago, fate without works was dead. So the first reason for this step is what Bill Wilson uh, articulates in this quote, that when we have experienced grace, we need to share that grace with others. When we have experienced healing, we can share that healing with others. When we have experienced forgiveness, we share that forgiveness with others. Now, the second reason for this step, and maybe not so obvious reason, although it's not hidden, the second reason for this step is, frankly, it helps us too. You see, most of us don't get to a point in our lives where we have experienced forgiveness, we have experienced transformation, we've experienced salvation, we've experienced newness of life, and then we experience it from then on. Everything's hunky-dory from then on. Everything's giggles and blushes. Beautiful. No. Most of us experience that, and maybe even that same day, recognize that we, are, we slip so easily back into our brokenness. And so, the 12th step, which calls on us to share what we have experienced with others, helps other people, but it also helps us. Bill Wilson continues, My friend had said faith without works was dead, and how appallingly true for the alcoholic, or for the sinner. For if an alcoholic failed to perfect and enlarge her or his spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others, that alcoholic could not survive the certain trials and the low spots ahead. Bill Wilson recognized that the service to others, the helping others, was just as important to him as it was to those others. Jesus, of course, knew this. Remember all those places where Jesus said things like, uh, those who want to save their life must lose it? Where Jesus said things about being a servant, a slave, rather than a Lord and a master. Where Jesus said to his disciples after that last supper in John's gospel, remember that I came not as one to be served, but as one who serves. And he said this as he washed their feet. Jesus knew the importance of reaching out and helping one another and the importance that the, the importance that, that had for us as much as for others. Dietrich Bonhoeffer also knew this. We referred to Dietrich Bonhoeffer a couple of weeks ago, the German theologian who worked in opposition to Adolf Hitler in Germany. Bonhoeffer said in his writings that uh, faith and obedience were two sides to the same coin. In other words, Bonhoeffer said, if you're having trouble with your faith, if you're having trouble trusting God, if you're having trouble with the, um, the discipleship in your life, uh, the, the, the antidote to that is not uh, to just, just try real hard to believe. The antidote to that, Bonhoeffer asserts, is obedience. If you're having trouble with your faith, in other words, go to work. Be a disciple. Do the things that disciples do. Worship and love God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength, maybe even if you don't quite feel it. Reach out to those who are hurting. Uh, show love for your neighbor. Feed the hungry. Visit the lonely or the, the, the grieving. Reach out to other people and be what a disciple is supposed to be. Do what a disciple is supposed to do. And Bonhoeffer said, amazingly, miraculously, when we do those things, when we are obedient, when we do the work, we often find that faith is no longer a problem. Trust is no longer a problem. 
12 step. We reached out to other people, sharing with them what we had experienced. Jesus knew this. Dietrich Bonhoeffer knew it. And on some level, perhaps we know it to be true. Friends, we, we all are broken in some way. I'm broken. You're broken. We are all broken. Here's the good news. We have something special in our brokenness. Because God uses broken people. Richard Rohr, I think, is precisely right. And he is precisely in line with so many of the biblical stories. That God uses us in spite of our brokenness. God uses, in fact, our brokenness. So that others might experience forgiveness and grace and new life. So that others might experience the, the powerful good news of being lifted out of the pit of sin and brokenness in which we so often find ourselves. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to conclude our worship this morning um, with prayer together. And I'd like to use for our prayer time a prayer that I used, I think, a couple of weeks ago in the first uh, recorded video worship, although I didn't use it in its entirety. And this is the Great Litany. Uh, the Great Litany in, 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 in different forms has been used for, for many ages in the church, and it is historically, traditionally used on uh, Sundays, uh, on, on different days during the Lenten seasons and the Advent season. I want to use that, this as our prayer today, because it is a very comprehensive kind of prayer. It's a long prayer, and Generally, normally, if we were all together and we were doing this, you would have a copy of portions of it in your, in your bulletins or, or before you so that you could respond at the appropriate places with the appropriate words. So it's, this is going to be a little different because I'm going to be reading uh, the calls and the responses. Um, but there are, just to, to give you a, a sort of outline of the prayer, um, after some prayers of approach to God, there are prayers for deliverance, uh, prayers that recall Christ's saving work, and prayers of intercession for the church, for our country, uh, for all people. And then the prayer concludes uh, with the Lord's Prayer. So I'd invite you now uh, to pray with me and all the church as we pray the great litany. Let us pray. O oh God, the Father, creator of heaven and earth, have mercy on us. O oh God, the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. O oh God, the Holy Spirit, Advocate and Guide, have mercy on us. Holy, blessed, and glorious Trinity, three persons and one God, have mercy on us. Remember not, Lord Christ, our offenses, nor the offenses of our forebears. Spare us, good Lord. Spare your people whom you have redeemed with your precious blood. From spiritual blindness, from pride, vainglory, and hypocrisy, from envy, hatred, and malice, and from all want of charity, good Lord, deliver us. From all deadly sin, and from the deceits of the world, the flesh, and the devil, good Lord, deliver us. From all false doctrine, heresy, and schism. From hardness of heart and contempt for your word and commandments, good Lord, deliver us. From earthquake and tempest, from drought, fire, and flood, from pandemic, from civil strife and violence, from war and murder, from dying suddenly and unprepared, good Lord, deliver us. 
by the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your baptism, your fasting and temptation, and by your proclamation of the kingdom, good Lord, deliver us. By your bloody sweat and bitter grief, by your cross and suffering, and by your precious death and burial, good Lord, deliver us. By your mighty resurrection, by your glorious ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Spirit, good Lord, deliver us. In our times of trouble, in our times of prosperity, in the hour of death, and on the day of judgment, good Lord, deliver us. And now receive our prayers of interse intercession, O Lord our God. Govern and direct your holy church. Fill it with love and truth and grant it that unity which is your will. Hear us, good Lord. Enlighten all ministers with true knowledge and understanding of your word that by their preaching and living they may declare it clearly and show its truth. Hear us, good Lord. Encourage and prosper your servants who spread the gospel in all the world and send out laborers into the harvest that we might share the good things we have experienced, forgiveness and healing and newness of life. Hear us, good Lord. Bless and keep your people that all may find and follow their true vocation and ministry. Hear us, good Lord. Give us a heart to love and reverence you that we may diligently live according to your commandments. Hear us, good Lord. To all your people, give grace to hear and receive your word and to bring forth the fruit of the Spirit. Hear us, good Lord. Strengthen those who stand firm in the faith. Encourage the faint-hearted. Raise up those who fall and finally give us the victory. Hear us, good Lord. And hear our intercessions for our country. Rule the hearts of your servants, the President of the United States, Donald Trump, our Congress, our state and local government, and all who are in authority that they may do justice and love mercy and walk in the ways of truth. Hear us, good Lord. Bless and defend all who strive for our safety and protection and shield them in all dangers and adversities, especially in this time of the coronavirus pandemic. Hear us, good Lord. Grant wisdom and insight to those who govern us, and to judges and magistrates the grace to execute justice with mercy. Hear us, good Lord. And hear our intercessions for all people, all of your children created in your image. To all nations grant unity, peace, and concord, and to all people give dignity, food, and shelter. Hear us, good Lord. Grant us abundant harvests, strength and skill to conserve the resources, the, uh, resources of the earth and the wisdom to use them well. Hear us, good Lord. Enlighten with your spirit all who teach and all who learn. Hear us, good Lord. Come to the help of all who are in danger, necessity, and trouble. Protect all who travel by land, air, or water, and show your pity on all prisoners and captives. Hear us, good Lord. Strengthen and preserve all women who are in childbirth and all young children. Comfort the aged, the bereaved, and the lonely. Hear us, good Lord. Defend and provide for the widowed and the orphaned, the refugees and the homeless and the immigrants. 
the unemployed and, and, and so many who live in the unknown fear of what will come of their jobs. All who are desolate and oppressed. Hear us, good Lord. Heal those who are sick in body, mind, or spirit. And give skill and compassion to all who care for them. Hear us, good Lord. Grant us repentance, forgive our sins, and strengthen us by your Holy Spirit to amend our lives according to your Holy Word. Hear us, good Lord. Son of God, we ask you to hear us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us and grant us peace. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. As we lift these and all our prayers to you, using the prayer that you taught your disciples and that was handed on to us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, as we leave this space, this, this time together, I charge you to be disciples, to do the work of discipleship. It's difficult in this time when we are disconnected from one another, when we've been socially distanced, when we cannot come together as we once did, but it's, it's not impossible. We can still reach out to one another through social media, through emails, through written letters, through phone calls. We can show the love of Christ to others. We have experienced grace. We've experienced forgiveness. We've experienced healing and new things in our lives. Let us share that with those around us as best we can. And as we leave this time together, may the love of God the grace of Jesus Christ, his son, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and all those you love, wherever they may be this day and forever. Amen.